Full Metal Alchemist 2017 is the worst adaptation I've seen since M. Night Shyamalan's Last Airbender. I say that without hyperbole. Certainly, this is the worst entry in the Full Metal Alchemist franchise. Worse than Shambhala, worse than even Sacred Star of Milos. It doesn't even compare to other anime and manga adaptations. The Kenshin movies are pretty good. Also, Old Boy was based on a manga, and that's a masterpiece. Edge of Tomorrow is pretty well liked as well. There have been plenty of adaptations that tower over this one. Plus, if we're thinking by the logic that we need to be comparing adaptations of manga to other adaptations of manga, then Silent Hill is a 10 out of 10 film, because compared to other video game adaptations, it's just pretty okay. A bad film is a bad film. End of story. I've seen films made with low budgets that pull off the Hollywood experience, and I've played better indie titles than AAA games despite their limitations. Just because something's lower budget doesn't necessarily make it worse. The director even said himself that the visuals were going to challenge Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Even he thinks we should compare. All that said, let's tear this film a new one. FMA 2017 has all the hallmarks of B-grade schlock. Terrible acting, lighting, camera angles, set design, you name it. It's here in all its spectacular awfulness. But really what brings it down most is shit storytelling and direction. The movie makes an absolute mess out of introducing the world of Fullmetal Alchemist. Ed Nal's mom dies within the first two minutes of the film after delivering a handful of lines. Evan? It's extremely hard to care. It's not even explained how she dies, nor is it foreshadowed. She's fine one second and then dead the next, and her kids just fucking stare at her. As much of an issue as I take with the way FMA Brotherhood handled Trisha's death, this is a whole new level of absurdity. I've always said that 2003 had the stronger approach in regards to dealing with the mother and their backstory. It makes me sympathize with the Elrics. I got to know how much they love their mother due to her prolonged screen time, so I was invested in their attempt to bring her back. In proper screenplay structure, the death of the mother would act as the catalyst for the film, something to ignite the series of events. In most films, including Japanese ones, they would have taken time to develop Ed and Al's bond with their mother. That would have lasted 10 or 20 minutes before her death, which would kick off the rest of the film. As it stands, we know extremely little about Ed and Al and how they feel about each other in their childhood, their father, or their mother. Contrasting this with the anime does no favors, but especially as a standalone film, it's unforgivable. The priorities of this film are very clear. It wasn't to make a good movie, but make a movie that had enough of the source material shoved in to pander to the fan base. The death of their mother and attempted resurrection. The father Cornell's Alan. identity crisis. Introduction and death of Dr. Marco. Alphonse's soul rejecting Fusion his armor. Nina and Alexander. Death of Maze Hughes. Laboratory 5. The Ravioli Massacre. Which happens off Envy screen. revealed as Hughes' killer. Zombie soldiers. Killing of lust. Ed encountering Al at the gate. This movie is recapping roughly 20 episodes across FMA Brotherhood and elements from the very end of the show that really lead nowhere. In exchange for shoving in as much as humanly possible, it abandons logic, pacing, and simple storytelling techniques. Along with the botched intro, the film doesn't set up the world building in a concise way. The manga introduces the mechanics of alchemy within the first 15 pages and builds off of that knowledge the whole time. It's also shown instead of just told, and it's really easy to get behind. That's not mentioning FMA 2003 and Brotherhood, both of which introduce alchemy and its concepts within three minutes apiece. This film doesn't bother to do any of that until 17 plus minutes in, well past the catalyst. If the bad child acting, poor integrated VFX, and breakneck pacing didn't get you to tab out on Netflix, the confusing world building just might. All this could have been done in the opening itself. As it stands now, it leaves you scratching your head if you've never heard of Full Metal Alchemist. Certain keywords are meaningless without explanation. Alchemy, transmutation, equivalent exchange all go without elaboration until much later. <laughs> You see some circle at a start that's just floating in an abyss of floorboards with some random items and they transform into this horse abomination thing. You can't even make it out fully before it cuts away. Are we expected to have this image tied us down until the info dump later? There's no hands touching the circle, no drawing it. Nothing equivalent to episode 3 of 2003 which shows Ed and Al's process of making a doll. They should have just had something like that. This is crap world building delayed for what reason? We could have been shown everything at the start with this transmutation of a horse if they played their cards right. Then you'd be able to understand what's going on at a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So what if this guy can do clap alchemy? How am I supposed to know that that's special until they tell us after the fact? 
お兄さんはこういう錬成人がなくても錬金術が使える凄腕で And of course, this is disregarding the times where the film betrays its own rules, throwing off anyone who's just heard that long winded explanation on alchemy from Alphonse. Let's talk about the horrible directing here for a second. The funeral scene of Trisha Elric is a perfect example of absolute trash directing early on that follows throughout the whole film. It's clearly been shot in daylight, with color grading and contrast bringing it to an obnoxious level of darkness in an attempt to make fake rainfall. I went through the scene a couple times. I couldn't even tell they were trying to go for rain until I spotted a CGI raindrop or two superimposed onto the image. It would have been a Lot easier to plan for a cloudy day as it approaches magic hour. Have a few flags to block out the sun a little bit. They aren't that expensive. Make a rain machine. You can build one for 60 bucks and have some decent rain in your film. For some reason that's beyond fucking me, this film is terrified to actually use practical rain effects. Later on in the film, after Nina disappears from the movie, it's extremely obvious that the rain in the scene was superimposed onto the characters. They just wet their hair and clothes a bit. Slap on some rain into the foreground. There's no raindrops falling across Ed's face or Roy's face. No bouncing off their outfits or the ball in the field. It's been faked badly. Since Alice CGI, they have rain roll off of him, so it makes it even more obvious when you compare it to Ed and Roy. This is a philosophy that the film has about basically everything. CGI the crap out of it. We don't need the real thing. Instead of just doing something practical, they'd rather have done it with compositing, and compositing is not a crutch, it's a supplement. Fast forwarding a little bit to Ed and Tucker's confrontation after Nina's been transformed. Ignoring the hideous CGI Nina, let's just take a look at the scene for a second. FMA 2017 has no idea what the word tone means. It's clearly daytime in this scene. That or they used a 1K Ari and put it behind a window. The best shots have a half light or a backlight, which kind of casts the characters in a moody silhouette. But the thing is, it's still flat and extremely bland in comparison to Brotherhood and especially FMA03. In the original show, there were hot reds and oranges motivated by the darkness and artificial lighting. It felt hellish. Both Brotherhood and O3 had this scene take place in darkness, either because it was overcast. Or was in a basement. This feels like a fucking walk in the park by comparison. The lighting is too homogenized. I can see everything clearly. If they had increased the contrast, even closing the aperture on the camera by a little bit more, it would have gone a long way into making the scene moodier and more disturbing. And you wouldn't have to change a damn thing. That advice is free, bitch! Another thing about this movie, it has a lot of boring plain white walls. What if I shot this entire YouTube episode with white walls? Kind of lame, right? Having plain white walls in your film is the easiest way to make it look like a student project, and FMA 2017 has you covered. <laughs> This film's a technical joke. You don't need a high budget in order to avoid plain white walls. There's clearly props all around that could have been used in order to fill all that. You could paint the damn walls, hang up tapestries or something. Even just adjusting the focal length would have gone miles to make it look more professional. Just cut out the walls altogether. It's a creative and technical train wreck. And lacking budget doesn't excuse any of it. If that weren't enough, this film also uses flat lighting outside. Choosing to film things in shade rather than using the sunlight is a good choice that I think works against this film. That technique can look good, but considering just how flat everything is, I can't stand it. Compare this movie to Call Me By Your Name, also shot in Italy on a shoestring budget. By utilizing sunlight, Call Me By Your Name annihilates FMA 17. The buildings have contrast, and the sun is used as a backlight to create shadows and highlights across the characters. It's immediately more dynamic. FMA 2000 2017's buildings look fake as hell because of how rigidly they stick to shooting in shade. The bricks aren't allowed to cast shadows to enhance the texture. Filmmaking is about choices, and nothing is 100% objective, but these deviations are certainly not motivated, and the result, in my opinion, is 
hideous. Most of this movie is blank white rooms lit with windows. Fuck this movie. While we're here in technical land, let's also talk about the score. I'm no whiz kid at music, but this sounds like artificial instruments to me. High quality midis or something. And the tone is zany, more fit for something like Power Rangers or a dating sim. Do we even need to compare this OST with the anime versions? Do we need to have that conversation? Of course, there's no iconic songs, untouched anyways, from FMA in this score either. No Brothers, no Lapis Philosophorum, and honestly, if they had just used the anime soundtrack, I would have been happier at least. They had orchestration as opposed to whatever this is. Most of the angles in this film are meh, standard affair. You have your medium lows, your longs at eye level, your shot reverse shot conversations, etc. But when FMA 2017 tries to be ambitious, oh, <laughs> well, you get this beauty. The ground was so important that we had to crane onto it just to get a good look. That's some sexy concrete. You know what I'm saying? Then there's the fucking performances. Oh my goodness. There's a reason why humans don't behave like slapstick fucking cartoons. The acting is melodramatic, cheesy, and fucking fake. I don't buy into anyone, maybe Mace Hughes. This is disgracefully bad. And the child acting, dear lord. Look, if you want to avoid having bad child actors, just cast a teenager for the role of Edward instead of a supermodel. That way you can have the film take place within, say, a two year span of time, and there's no need to have a different actor play the younger version. The fact they even had dream sequences to justify older Ed playing younger Ed's role in the more dramatic scenes shows how little faith they had in the child actors. Just don't have fucking child actors if you can't find good ones. You are great. When is your violin concert? June 15th. God, <sighs> fucking hell. What's the day today? Since the story is so busy cramming in all the plot threads from the first 20 or so episodes of Brotherhood, and not even in faithful ways, mind you, I've seen people on YouTube tell me this was faithful. Are you, did you watch a different show? The writers apparently forgot to build in a character arc for its protagonist. The film is called Full Metal Alchemist, but the Full Metal Alchemist doesn't learn diddly squat. What's the point of watching a film if nothing happens to the main character? In fact, none of the characters grow or change in any way during the events of the movie, aside from possibly Alphonse who goes through a tired arc where he affirms that he is indeed a real boy. The whole climax of the film 
where cool shit happens, goes directly to Roy Mustang, and Edward doesn't contribute much at all. Just because some of the staff searched on YouTube and figured fans really liked that scene where Roy burns lust to death doesn't mean you should have given the moment to Roy and not Edward. Anywhere Ed would have learned something is contained within the last 10 minutes after he has the stone. If Ed was an ends justifies the means kind of character, then I could see him not using the stone as a way for him to learn something. But it wasn't set up. It's so weird. He uses the stone after Armor Al says no, and then he sees real Al, and then chooses not to use the stone. Why? The cause and effect is non-existent. Why would he stop using the stone? Did he never intend to and just wanted to see a woman posing as Al? The arc is is not really an arc. That would mean he'd actually have to be different at the start and then change. I don't buy it for a hot second. Ed's arc in 2003 was to accept death and take responsibility for his actions. Brotherhood Ed's arc was to relinquish power and discover the answer to saving Al was under his nose the whole time. Movie Ed's arc is to not use the stone, something he learns in the five minutes after having found it, and I don't know what changes him, or if he'd even be the kind of person to use the stone in the first place. This movie also wrecks the possibility of doing something interesting with Roy, since the whole point of Roy was to build up rage further and further until he found out Hughes' killer. Since Roy knows immediately who killed Hughes, his rage doesn't get to build. He doesn't need to be restrained by reason and pals, he just roasts Envy. It's so weak, and should have been something built up for future films. They hit the reset button on Envy anyhow. Why did he need to quote unquote die in this movie? If they try to bring it back for a sequel, it won't be as strong now because Roy had a chance to process who done it. Then there's a bunch of lazy bullshit. Marco dying immediately after being introduced. No resolution with Nina. She just never got brought up again after Tucker's dragged off since Scar wasn't in this movie to kill her. No showing Hughes' funeral or any catharsis in regarding to building up to his death. Then it covers stuff I never even fucking liked to begin with, like Alphonse thinking he's not real. That's filler to the nth degree and resolved in an episode back in the anime. You also have the Immortal Army in this too, which is a bunch of crap from episode 50 plus, and they're just easily mowed down by firearms. So much for the Philosopher's Stone, am I right? This movie tanks every plot thread it gets his grubby hands around and reads like a bad recap film written by a prevalent fanfic author who seriously misjudged his haircut. The new crap with Tucker, General Hakuro, and framing Roy Mustang was a bunch of bullshit. I've heard fans say it's mostly faithful to the series, but is it really? The solution to all this, besides just not making the film in the first place, is to bite off much less. By pulling back the amount of characters focused on and plot threads, we could really have had a decent movie on our hands rather than an M. Night tier monstrosity. The Last Airbender also resorted to summarizing episodes upon episodes of plot beats and have horrendous CGI in acting. I don't see how this film is different. If they took the time building Ed and Al's relationship to one another and their mother, they could have had her die after 15 minutes or so. The filmmakers could have focused on the aftermath, the burning of the Elric household, the promise to get each other's body back, the state alchemy exam. Taking your time is absolutely required. You could even go the FMA 03 route and incorporate Nina to the alchemy exam, and with a confrontation with Scar after he murdered her. If you incorporate Ed's lack of self-preservation early on, you could have him change after the confrontation with Scar. Ed learns to value his own life in spite of his guilt. It's simple but effective, and that's how you'd make a decent first FMA movie. Not trying to shovel in everything onto your plate all at once. One movie at a time, people! You don't need Lior to establish the world. You don't need Hughes to die. You don't need Roy to kill Lust. Try Try seeing what happens when you set your players in the world and focus on making a good movie with a central point of view. Edward Elric. After setting up a decent origin story, you can totally branch off from there. Have the story go in whatever direction you want. Justify this version of FMA as its own thing, maybe with its own villain and larger conflict. Play with it. It's never going to live up to either adaptation of FMA if it's in the shadow of both of them. As it stands, FMA 17 is fucking B-grade garbage for anyone who wants to see a really shitty version of Brotherhood. There's so much more to tear apart, and I expect other YouTubers will have covered that for me. Do we really need one of the greatest franchises in anime butchered this badly? I don't think so. Go Jesus out, motherfuckers. If you like my content and want to see videos like this early, then support me on Patreon. I, of course, want to thank all my patrons. Despite having hard financial problems in school, you've all been looking out for me. Thank you very much. Look forward to my next one being something a little bit more positive. Also, real talk, I think everyone should support this movie. Yeah, yeah, I know what I said. 
It's just so fucking hilarious to me. I definitely want to see what they do with the sequel. Buy it on Blu-ray. Make Full Metal Alchemist 2020 a thing.